So Antonio, this is uh, perhaps your first drive in a uh, Duesenberg Model A? This is my first time in a Duesenberg Model A. Well, I'm going to ask you a very, very, very pointed question. Okay. What model designation has no manufacturer ever used? Oh. <laughs> You've already stumped me. I have no, <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Mark 1. Okay. No manufacturer ever introduces the brand new Antonio Malegri Mark 1 because it's always a name given in retrospect when the next one comes out. The Mark 2 then begats a Mark 1. Are you talking about Volkswagen? I'm talking, talking about? about Volkswagen, I'm talking about Jaguar, I'm talking about all sorts of manufacturers. And although this is not a Duesenberg Mark 1, the fact is that the Duesenberg brothers and the Duesenberg company never called this the Model A until after the Model J uh, was introduced. Okay, interesting. This was the Duesenberg Straight 8, America's first production straight eight-cylinder car. Wow. Well, and, uh, go ahead. I, you know, I, I don't know too much about these cars, but one thing I can appreciate about modern cars is on a day like today, the windows would be up and I would have the heat on. It's a little cold in here with our, you know, 35 degree temperature outside right now. <laughs> well, you know, Antonio, the interesting thing is, of course, the earth hasn't gotten significantly <laughs> colder uh, since this car was built. But I think that the way humans travel in cars has certainly changed. Oh, absolutely. Uh, it reminds me of a great uh, statement that uh, someone in Scandinavia made, I heard it 14th hand, but that there is no such thing as bad weather, only the wrong clothing. That's true. And That's uh, very true. I'm dressed in my usual dashing fashion here in this Duesenberg today, and yeah, I'm freezing. Well, my apologies, I have a McLaren vest on today. I should have worn my Ferrari vest. Well, actually, your Duesenberg straight eight vest would have been great. I'll have to make sure you get one of those. But actually, that's another interesting parallel. Because, of course, McLaren, the famous race team, now racing in more formula than ever before in the company's history, of course, is a great builder of road cars. And the Duesenberg brothers, above all else, were racers and builders of race cars. Yeah, yeah. And that's the great claim to fame that this car has this overhead cam eight cylinder engine was very much derived from the engines they built for their race cars, Indianapolis winning race cars. Wow. So, I mean, that's kind of a direct correlation with supercars and whatnot that you can buy today with a dumbed down Formula One engine. I mean, you look at the Mercedes AMG one with a Formula One engine. I guess this is kind of the same thing in a, in a in a touring version. Exactly, and uh, one of the great uh, pities, of course, is the fact that the Duesenberg brothers were terrific engineers, but they were awful businessmen, and although they had a good marketing sense, I mean, they knew that they could set records with their cars and make customers want these really powerful and sophisticated cars, but as much as I love the way this car looks, it doesn't look like a race-derived car. It looks sort of like any other touring car of the period. It, it does, but I mean, one thing that I can comment from at least the passenger seat is how dashing the, the hood ornament is and how long the hood is in this really fantastic, I don't even know what to call it, a teal. It's, it's some sort of green, but it is an experience and it, and it, is, it is special in here, that's for sure. It's, uh, it's, it's a statement of their mechanical ability and, and what made their race cars so capable. The fact that we're sort of toddling along on this country road, but you can also feel the smoothness of this engine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was pretty amazed when you shifted it into higher gear before how much quieter everything got. And when we were rolling around in first and second, it was kind of hard to hear you. But now, what, are we in third? We're in third gear. Yeah, we're in third, and it's it's so much quieter in here. And you could have a full-fledged conversation with someone. And if the road was smoother, it would be even easier. Exactly. And one of the things that's also quite interesting is that this car and this engine have two very different characteristics. One very much a characteristic of the period that cars like this, a, a high-performance luxury car, was still meant to be primarily driven in top gear, 
And one of the ways that they tested the metal of a car, as it were, was to see how low you could go in Top Gear and pull away smoothly and maintain the power, the way it delivers power is very much in the period, and yet, you also know this is a very powerful engine. When you put your yeah, foot in it, yeah. it wants to go. Easy, you're gonna scare me. We're gonna come <laughs> up upon the uh, the film truck. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it seems like it has a lot of really good, uh, good power band and a lot of torque. And for a car also on a fairly heavily cambered road, the handling also is pretty good. I mean, it's got a uh, fairly wide turning uh, circle, as you might imagine, a car of this type, but uh, it's very responsive. Yeah, and and I would almost prefer something like this with skinnier tires. I know when we've come down this road in the past with maybe the Dodge Viper or some other uh, newer cars that we filmed on our YouTube channel, on the, on the Crown Roads, when you accelerate, you can see the car kind of dart back and forth because the wider tires don't really have a, a smooth and solid contact patch to, to fit on the ground, whereas this is, seems to be doing fine because the tires are skinnier. So exactly. maybe this is safer than a newer car, on, at least on this <laughs> road. Well, you know, safer is a relative term, <laughs> but certainly um, more responsive to the road conditions. Because these, these are, this is very much a road much like the ones that this car would have been driven on when this car was new. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was, this was probably a good road for back then. I don't know how we would describe it today, but... It's an adequate road. It is, but you know what? <laughs> We're, th I would say that this is more comfortable than riding in the Suburban that we've been using for filming because the seat seems to soak up a lot of the bumps and obviously it's a bumpy road. That There's no, there's no discounting that, but the seat is really comfortable and you do... I'm not upset at all in here. I'm actually enjoying myself. It's quite nice. You mentioned something which is also very important, which has largely been forgotten in a lot of modern cars, and certainly people who drive modern cars forget about it. But every component of the car, tires, suspension, seats, all form the ride and driving experience. And these were designed, the chassis in cars like this of this period are still designed to flex. So the chassis is a part of the suspension system and a part of the, the ride experience of the car. And you don't get that in the modern car, which is designed to be very tight. Yeah, no, that's, that's actually true. I mean, it seems to be soaking up everything fine, but I guess this is kind of the, obviously this was a fast car for the day, but I guess this is kind of the philosophy of driving uh, a slow car fast is more fun than driving a fast car slow. I mean, I don't know. What are we doing? Maybe, maybe 30 miles We're an hour. We're doing about right? 30 miles per hour yeah. right now. And I'm totally comfortable, and I, I don't want to be going any faster. If I was in a Porsche or a Ferrari or something, I'd want to be going as fast as humanly possible right now. But this well, is, on this road, I don't know if that may, would be necessarily not. a, maybe a maybe satisfying not. experience. We'd be having a conversation <laughs> like this, Donald, the and kidney puncher. When, when you think about uh, what? the Duesenberg brothers did not achieve with this car. Uh, they only built about 650 of them from 1921 to 1926, but nonetheless it sort of laid a marker down and certainly attracted the interest, the interest of uh, Everett Loeb and Cord, who bought their company and of course uh, launched the Model J. Now there was another model in between the A and the J, which strangely enough has the designation Model X. Okay. Very, very, very rare car, a derivation of this car. And uh, our friend Jay Leno has a Model X, not surprisingly, because he's quite the Duesenberg collector. He is. And uh, it's an interesting thing. One of my favorite Duesenbergs is actually a Model A. There's a wonderful Doctor's Coupe, which is a very sleek, very elegant, uh, bent seat, three-seater, basically, uh, but sort of basically a two-seater three car. Three-seater? Well, a three-person Three-person seat, sorry, a bench seat, <laughs> not a three-seater. No, it's, it's not. It's not a uh, tour bus for the for the Rockies. No, <laughs> um, but it's a really neat thing, and uh, much like some of the smaller vintage Rolls Royces, the 2025, that sort of get short shrift compared to Silver Ghost or Phantom Twos. I think the Model A is something that is largely overlooked uh, in terms of an historical context, and it's a, and it's a terrific car. Think about think about this. 
think about sort of the, the, the lost models of some other manufacturers. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, we'll go back to yours and my favorite Ferraris. There are some terrific Ferraris built in the 1970s and late 60s, the 365 GTC4. Yeah. It's a fantastic car that not a lot of people know about because they know about Daytonas. The Daytonas, but also maybe the, the 400i platform. 400i, exactly. I, I, I honestly feel like this feels like a 400i. Ah. It's, it's very similar. I mean, if we're thinking of color, interior color, <laughs> but more of the driving experience. I remember how comfortable that car was. And this is, I, I can't get over how comfortable this car is. Temperature aside, you could you could truly travel very very far with this car, and I'm sure back in the day, that was such a luxury and such a fun thing to do. How does this relate to other pre-wars that you've driven? Well, the controls are very heavy, very deliberate. In fact, you know, again, making a modern uh, vintage comparison, it's like an early Lamborghini where everything is very heavy, the clutch is very heavy, the shifts are very deliberate. Um, compared to something like a Bugatti or a Rolls Royce, this feels much heftier. Mm. Uh, and again, that's not surprising given the fact that race cars of the period were not light, sprightly things. They were things designed to uh, endure, uh, you know, 500 miles around the, the, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the bricks. Huh. Not something that you do in a light Vacheret car like a Bugatti. No. You know, you needed strength. And well, it, it, it seems like, I mean, at least with some of the older cars that I've driven, I can't, this is too old for me, Donald. <laughs> but You've so, gone back to 1940. We have. So. We, that, that is the oldest car I've ever driven was that, was the Seattle we did the Mill a Million on with. But sometimes with harder controls, it's almost more satisfying because it's much more of a challenge and you feel a lot better about yourself and your own driving abilities when you master a shift or you really go through a curve well. It, it's, I think we're truly spoiled with how good modern vehicles drive. Much Sometimes like, when you come back to something like this, you, you appreciate how, how far the technology has come. Much like using a traditional digital, even a digital single lens reflex camera versus what we do on our, our smartphones now. Yeah, Smartphone yeah. cameras are so incredibly capable. Uh, you can just take snaps, you know, 10, 13, 14 in a row. You're gonna get a really good picture at some point, yeah. but it's not the same as aiming a lens and, and focusing it and, and looking at the light and seeing how the composition is formed. Well, we only have a limited number of shots anyway. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you're absolutely right on that uh, context. Uh, going back again to comparing this car to others of its type. Now granted, this is a 1923 car designed in 1920, uh, but comparing this to a late 20s Bentley, a crickle with Bentley. Okay. The Bentley is a much more modern car than this Duesenberg. Uh, the shift is as challenging, but it feels totally modern in terms of the way its chassis dynamics are, uh, the way it accelerates, all of that. This feels much more vintage than a 1927 or 28 Bentley. And it's clear to see why the Bentley was so successful. Although I think with, with the proper development and attention, a Duesenberg like this certainly could have been the, the equal of the Bentley and certainly the Model J, yeah. <laughs> which is the true contemporary of, of that Bentley that I was talking about, the 1927-1928. The 1928 and 1929 Duesenberg Model J is a car a world apart from this. How would something like this relate to the 37 um, four and a quarter liter Bentley that we have in the collection? Because I- Vastly I've, different. Yeah, because yeah. every single, I've, I've never been in that car, but I've seen you drive it a couple times. And that seems like such a modern car for, for the time. It is an amazing car, and of course, it's a car that a lot of traditional Bentley enthusiasts also dismissed because they said it was just a Rolls Royce and Bentley drag. And <laughs> I think the better for it, because the Rolls Royce chassis is very, very smooth, very capable, didn't have that sporting edge that the Bentley had, certainly, but um, 
again, it's a testament as well to automotive progress. And uh, in the exhibition in the Audrain, uh, Landmarks in Early Engineering, uh, this car features uh, in that exhibition, um, as well as some of the other cars. And the pace of development in this period, from basically 1914, 1915, right before World War I, through the mid and late 1920s, is remarkable. Oh, absolutely. And I think what's really exciting, at least for someone who is a little bit removed from this kind of stuff, like myself, I'm really amazed at how much attention to detail is put in these cars. And as I'm looking around, even at the pedals, the, the mold on the pedals, and the way that the dashboard is laid out, there's a lot of thought put into it. But also, you can tell that the people building these were artists and craftsmen. I mean, this was all done by hand. It wasn't like today where it's just a plastic button and it's just kind of thrown in there with no thought or there's a, an iPad that stretches across the, the dashboard. I mean, this, this really is an experience. Even all the knobs and everything else, I mean, we, we lack that in cars today. I mean, maybe a Pagani or something like that where all the swish, switches are, are milled from titanium, but in more approachable vehicles, I could say, that doesn't really exist anymore. No, but we also have to remember this is a very, very, very expensive yes, car yes. when it was new. You compare this to a 1923 Ford Model T, yes. and you'll see a huge difference in materials, not in fit and finish, because you know all cars are built very well, even the, the, the Model T oh, on the yeah. assembly line was assembled oh, yeah. very, very carefully. But nonetheless, you saw a bigger difference back then between a very expensive car and an inexpensive car than you ever see today. The yeah. fit and finish and design of inexpensive cars today is absolutely remarkable. Very, uh, that's true, that's very true. And you think about what you get sort of between 30,000 and 300,000 is not the same gap that you got when Back this car was new between $800 and $8,000. <laughs> and this is an $8,000 car when a Model T was an $800 car. Wow. Wow. Feel the way this thing pulled up this I know. Hill. I can't get over how much power it has. What would the top speed of something like this be? It'd be probably about 80 miles per hour. Let's not do that. <laughs> I'm, I'm no, comfortable with what we're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, on the right road, you can certainly see that this car would be absolutely comfortable and capable at, at that speed. Now, of course, one of the things you have to remember, and we have to remember today, is the fact that these brakes are very, not, very, not very much brakes. not modern brakes. And it, it really is a great reminder of something that I call the go-stop ratio. <laughs> uh, I refer to that all the time. The fact that engineers made cars go fast a lot sooner than they made them go stop quickly. Very true. I think the funniest thing for me during this whole ride is every time I watch you, go to shift to, to uh -huh. second gear or to third gear, you have to reach for the gear shifter because we're sitting so far back, which is different than a lot of pre-wars because I feel like in a lot of them, you're on top of all Absolutely. the controls. Absolutely. Whereas it, this, not so much. The amount of space that you have in this in this cockpit is, is astonishing. And that's another thing that sets it apart from a lot of cars of its type because you actually do have room that, that is almost unimaginable. Yeah, we do have a lot of room. I can't get over the leg room. You never have leg room in a pre-war. I mean, I'm not the, the, the biggest guy, but when you and, and uh, Jay drive some <laughs> of these cars on mansions and motor cars, yeah, you're completely on top of each other. But we have plenty of room. You guys should have picked this for one of the mansions <laughs> and motor cars. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, it's one of the surprising things as well because they did make a town car version of the Model A. Apparently they made very, very few of them. But most of these cars were owner-driver cars. And I think that also makes a difference as well. Um, although again, I'm sort of hard pressed to imagine the six foot one person this car was actually designed for. Yeah. Um, it is uh, something that the science of ergonomics has certainly developed <laughs> since uh, 1923 in this car. Absolutely. I'd like to go back to what you said about 
limited numbers. Today, every car manufacturer has a limited something or other or a special edition and it comes oh you know 2,000 units <laughs> or, and all oh, there's there's not many of them but back in the day I mean you mentioned before it was 650 in the yes, total production run 650 I mean how many of that 650 were destroyed how many of that 650 still exist today how many of that 650 are in this condition obviously this has been restored but I don't know. I mean, cars were so much rarer back then. And I, I feel like if you were a, a young boy, when this car came out, seeing this for the first time would be so impressionable. Now, kids can access cars and, and everything from their cell phone, which I think is great. But at the same time, I don't know if it's as special as it would have been back in 23, seeing this for the first time. Seeing any car, in 1923 yeah, it was still yeah, a treat yeah. for a lot of people and to see a car like this would have been absolutely extraordinary because again while the media world in which we live today certainly did not exist then people still knew about the indianapolis 500 yeah. and racing cars and record-setting cars um, the duesenberg brothers with basically this engine set three or four speed records right before this car was introduced. I can't imagine doing that. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that this would have been, you know, the equivalent of, of seeing a, uh, a LaFerrari drive down your road and imagining that this has a connection with those great heroes that drove those yeah, cars on yeah. the speedways. Well, you know how excited I get when I see any Ferrari or especially a LaFerrari when we were on the Mille Miglia and I saw one and you were like, no, 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 we have to go this way. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, looking at the cars is fine, but after we're out of the car. <laughs> but you know, that reminded me of something else. Um, thinking about this 1923 car, uh, the fact that uh, I was thinking about doing the Mille Miglia again in that uh, 1927 Fiat and uh, how incredibly different that experience would be from the 1940 Seattle that we drove. I would need a lot more snacks if we did that with that car. <laughs> Although this car you'd have more room. Uh, True, so snacks. that's a good thing. It's, uh, <laughs> it's remarkable to think about the ability that we have today to experience all these very different driving, driving worlds. And uh, you know, it's something that, that I, I wouldn't miss for the, for, for the world. I mean, this is just absolutely extraordinary to be able to do this. And this is a great example of what we were talking about, the tractability of the engine. I'm keeping it in top gear. Yeah. It pulls beautifully at 15 miles per hour in top gear. This is totally different than something new of today with 10-speed autos and 8-speed and autos and whatever it is. I'm sure there will be 12 within the next year. But this is very much, you just put it in that third gear and you just let the engine and the transmission do the talking. and. It's quite enjoyable. I mean, normally for me, I all I want is speed, 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 speed. <laughs> but with this, it's it's a different kind of motoring, but it's just as enjoyable as, as anything else. I think that's good though, because I feel like a lot of people get stuck in their ways about what kind of cars that they like and, and, and what, what kind of driving they and like. And what constitutes an interesting and involving yeah. driving or riding experience. Yeah. I think everyone has probably been behind uh, an old man on the road in their pre-war car and they're probably very frustrated that they're not doing 60, 70 miles an hour. But I think if you took those people, and I'm guilty of it myself, but if you took those people and you put them in a pre-war and gave them the experience, they would probably say, okay, I actually don't want to go faster than 30 or 40. <laughs> it's a different, it's totally different than what we have today. Entertainment can be found in all ways, at all speeds, on all types of roads. And you know, I think that especially today, if we can slow down just a little bit and be more present in every experience we have, especially in the driving experience, it'd be a really terrific thing. Absolutely. I think that's, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head, Donald. I think that's a, uh, a good place to end this video. Well, now we have to bring you back even further if we can. 
got to get you a nice veteran car one day and tell Okay, you. okay. I don't know about that, uh, that 1902 uh, Oldsmobile with, <laughs> with the tiller. <laughs> that would be perfect for you. Take that out in the track. <laughs> nope. Find the apex. Absolutely no. I, I'll tell you something. Do 180 miles an hour on the Panigale on a straightaway at the track. But this scares me more than anything else that's new and fast. Like I said, when we did the Mille Miglia, I couldn't get over how scary that car with 46 horsepower was. We don't want scary. No. 